And we're live. Hey, everyone. My name is Nachum Russell, or Russ to most of you, because nobody can say Nachum, so don't even try it. And this is Larry Crone. For the two of you out there who don't know who Larry Crone is, Larry Crone is a trainer in Tennessee and also author of the e-collar book that's like a bestseller e-collar book that everybody should own. And I'm really honored to have Larry on my show tonight. Um, Larry, before we jump into like chatting a little bit, do you want to like, obviously most people know who you are, but let's just do it anyways for the hell of it. Tell everyone a little bit about yourself, who you are and what you do. Oh, all right. Uh, yeah, no, no one's interested in that anymore, I think, <laughs> at this point. But uh, I actually live in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Oh, okay. sorry. <laughs> no, no, but, but most of my business, especially for the first several years, was all based out of the Nashville area. Okay. You know, so most people still think I operate, and, and I basically do. Actually, for years, I didn't even train dogs locally. They all came out of the Nashville area. Uh, started working dogs about the same time I became a federal agent, early 1996, January 1996, and uh, started like a lot of people. You know, I got a dog, and me and my wife just completely ruined it. It was, it was our baby. We did everything wrong, and we created a mental midget. You know, and first trainer I started working with with that dog was all behavior based. And, and that's what I was really interested in, you know, and, and I just fell in love with that side of it. And to make a long story short, that's what I really focused on. So for years, I didn't use food in training. I didn't use e collars. I trained with a leash and a flat collar. That, that was it. And it was all behavior based, you know. And I think I was fortunate that that was the first guy that I spent time working with and, and learning from. But be honest with you, later on, and I don't talk about it much, but I got to spend a good amount of time with a couple of people that were pretty well-known trainers. Um, but I learned the opposite. I learned exactly what I didn't want to be in dog training. And, and I think that was a lot more important, actually, early on in, in my career because I saw what dogs were being put through. And I saw the results. The results were there as far as the behaviors. The dog wasn't there. They were just destroyed. And, and I knew very early on that, you know, that could never be me. So that, that was a really good lesson for me, you know. And when I actually started the business, I, I was training dogs for a long time for free. I wasn't charging people. I just, I was, I loved it. And I wanted to work with as many dogs as, as possible, you know. And uh, from there, it just it just kind of took off. And when I started hanging around Nashville with with my dogs and my dogs were off leash, it was like a novelty to people. You know, there were no weren't using e collars or nothing. And and I could leave my Rottweiler outside store and go in and get a sandwich and he'd sit there and wait for me. And people were just like, what the? And that's really, you know, make a long story. That's how it started. And as soon as I worked with a couple of of the crummier dogs with the, uh, you know, the, the human aggression issues. It was kind of like a double edged sword because business blew up that that was it. then you know, I didn't have to do much marketing anymore, but those were the only dogs I was getting for several years. Cause that's what people thought I did. You know, I mean, that's literally what they thought I did. And that wasn't the case, you know? Um, and that, that can get kind of old, but, when I see young trainers like, like yourself and everything, I know a lot of people out there, they kind of crap on you guys, you young guys, because you have so much at your fingertips. And I think that's disgusting. And, and you've commented, because I've been going on your lives for a while, and you acted like you were surprised and you thanked me. You know, and, and what I said to you is I'm always going to support young trainers, always. You know, when you're doing the right thing and doing your best, I'm always going to support people. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there that don't feel that way. They're bitter. You know, they feel like uh, you guys have it easy. And in a way you do and in a way you don't, because everything you do is watched and scrutinized. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so I kind of got the best of both worlds because there was no social media, anything for a good part of the time I was training. And, and then once it started coming around, when I started making videos, if you watch those old video i still my videos are awful today but when you compare them to back then it was like it was like 70s porn it was just <laughs> pre-sophia days <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah. i mean it was just so bad but the 
you know, the whole thing that people pushed me towards was once I started getting more people watching them and I started getting a little better at it, the only thing I cared about was putting out information. If I thought something could help somebody, that's what I tried to do. And the videos were so bad. And I make tons of mistakes when I train always. And I never hid that. And then I remember saying at one point that, you know what, I'm going to get some nice video equipment. I'll get some editing equipment. And people hit the roof. They were like, no, don't do that. You know, there's plenty of that out. We actually want to see the work and the mistakes. And so to this day, what I still use is uh, my iPhone and that's it. You know, there, there's nothing else. We don't do editing. We don't cut things out that look bad. And, you know, I'll say it always. There's not a video you could watch over 500 videos I've done where I don't make a lot of mistakes. But I think people watch and learn the most when I could see the mistakes and go back and talk about it or fix it or do it better the next time, you, you know, and unfortunately there's so many people that are scared of putting out videos because of the shit that comes with it. That's well, part of scary. it. It you is know, a scary absolutely. thing. You know, yeah. You're putting yourself out there and you're putting yourself out there for everyone's scrutiny. Like every expert in the world is going to watch it and tell you what you've done wrong and how bad you are at it. But at the same yeah. time, you're also helping people. So it's like, a, it's like I think social media is a double-edged sword. Like, you didn't have to deal with that in the beginning, so you could just train dogs, right? right. And people yeah. would just see you training dogs, see the success you get, and that's it. Now it's almost like in, there's a part of it that in order to really get yourself out there, you're going to use social media. But then you're also dealing with the other side of social media, which is a lot of shit. And like a lot of people watching you, criticizing you and all that stuff. So there's like a double edged sword to all of it. Yeah. But but you know what, Russ, for a long time, you know, I'd have to get out there with my dogs out in public. I worked my dogs everywhere. I was never home. I had two careers. I had federal agent career and a dog training career. Yeah. And I was never home. If I wasn't at work with the government job, I was out either training dogs or working my own dogs to try to build a business, you know, and I live in Kentucky, an hour away from Nashville, and I was all over Nashville. I was on every busy street corner working my dogs. I was doing trade shows, you know, gun shows and, you know, agriculture shows and setting up a booth on the weekends. My wife's going with me to help me. I hated that stuff. I hated it. I did free in-home demonstrations for anyone who wanted them. So then you're showing up with your dog and you're talking to the people and you're showing them, you know, what you could do with your dog and you have to sell them on things. And I'm not a salesman. I hated it. It was, it actually got to a point where it became very depressing for me. And the times that I was in my car driving from place to place when my, you know, my wife was going to enjoy the weekend. And then when my kids were born, she's with my kids going to the pool to enjoy the pool. It used to really bum me out. And I remember saying something to somebody once like, you know, this dog training thing, it's a very lonely thing when you're going from place to place. And a bunch of dog trainers responded. They were like, oh my, I thought I was the only one. It's not an easy business when you're trying to make it, you know? Yeah. And so I'm happy for young trainers that they don't have to do that stuff now. You know what I mean? You guys have an advantage to, to where you can cut off years of mistakes by accessing people. You have some phenomenal trainers out there, you know, some offer free information, some you could pay and it's worth every penny to go on and learn from some of the best. Of course, you still have to put your hands on a lot of dogs, but it saves you countless hours of mistakes, you know, and Lord knows I've made every mistake on, especially business wise, you know, I've, I've worked a lot harder than I had to. I, I really did. And so when I see someone struggling, you know, you'll never see me go on someone's page and criticize their training. You know, if someone's abusing animals, that's the one time where I'll open my mouth and be very vocal. I have, I have no tolerance for that. If, if someone's a bad trainer and they're not doing good work, I just, I'll unfollow them. I don't want to see it, you know? And if someone else asks me about it, I won't comment. I used to, you know, but now if that particular trainer sends me an email and say, I'm getting a lot of crap from this, you know, can I get your honest opinion? I'll be honest. Yeah. I'll say, you know, it doesn't look good. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. The dog should never look like that, but I'm not going to do it publicly to try to gain attention for myself. 
and make someone else look bad. You know what I mean? Because we have people out there that their whole purpose, and there's there's a handful of them. Yeah. All they do is they spend their time criticizing other trainers. Well, you have to understand something. Every one of those trainers that do that consistently, they all have something in common. They're all lacking fulfillment in their lives. Whether it's their personal lives, their business life, or both, they're all struggling. And, you know, like we were talking about earlier, I feel sorry for them. I don't have hatred for those people. And every single one of them, the funny thing is, you know, and I've had it from, from plenty of them, a lot of what they say, I agree with. And I'll talk to any of them. And I have talked to a bunch of them. But what you see, you see the true colors once you start trying to talk to these people. They just, they have one mission and that is to use your name to get some more attention, you know what I mean? And blame everyone else for them not being successful. If you've been doing this for 20, 30, 40 plus years and you're struggling to pay the bills, it's not because your lack of social media. It's because of your lack of ability with dogs or and people. Yeah. Plain and simple. Okay. You haven't moved forward to catch up to where training is today. And, and that's the truth because I know a lot of trainers that have been doing this over 30 years, 40 years, no social media presence at all. No, you won't see anything online about them. And they financially do extremely well and have thriving businesses because they don't need social media. They've been doing phenomenal work for so long that that's, that's enough. You know what I mean? Their, their history of what they've done in the dog, in the dog world allows them to still remain at the top business-wise. Yeah, they've built credibility in real life without social media. Absolutely. So now when I see these people blaming young trainers for being big on social media, and listen, I agree with them with a lot of There are trainers that are really big on social media that are awful dog trainers. There's no doubt about it. But that has no bearing on you. You know, if you're struggling, that trainer who's doing well is not the one causing you a lack of success. And until you could really face that and be honest with yourself, you're going to struggle, you know, yeah. you're going to struggle. But I think that problem. whole that whole topic is like less of a dog training thing and more of like a personal development type thing. Like if you're not comfortable with who you are, if you're not good at being yourself and like being okay with being yourself, then you're gonna struggle in the long run. And you're going to try to build yourself up by tearing other people down, which never works. It just doesn't work for long-term success. No. And, and everything evolves and you have to evolve and move with the times. You just do. Everything does. And dog training is no different. You know, it, it yeah. just, it's dog training today is a lot easier, more gentle on the dogs with dogs with much better, happier attitudes. And, 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 and that's the truth. And anyone who denies that is, is kidding, kidding themselves, you know, yep. that's all. I think you were talking about, uh, um, how every video that you put out has a ton of mistakes. And one thing I'm 99% sure I learned this from you originally, I've heard it from a bunch of people, but I think you were the first person I heard it from of if you're, you're saying to young dog trainers and to dog owners that if you're training a dog, your own dog, someone else's dog, video it not necessarily to put it up anywhere right. but just rewatch it afterwards so that you can learn from what you did of what you can do better in the future and yeah it's a powerful yeah. one like i i did that for a while i don't do it now anymore because mm -hmm. i don't have time to watch my own videos anymore yeah. but for a while i would just video myself put it on my computer and just watch and kind of take notes on my work to see what i could try to enhance in the future and i think that in itself is powerful and that's probably a lot of what people learn from you is because you show everything Right. And you really don't there's no edits. You don't know what to do even. So there are no edits right. that right. it's just like people get to learn everything from it, the whole picture. And they get to also see that it's not perfect. Even if you've been training dogs for 30 years. Right. There's still those mistakes in every single session that if you watch carefully, you'll find them because it's still dog training. It's still a person training a dog. And both of those beings are not perfect. Yeah. No, I, 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 at least for me. There's always, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do with a dog until it gets here. Yeah. You know, I have no, and a lot of times when I, even if I've seen a dog before, let's say I'm doing private lessons, I think, okay, today we're going to do this. And then the dog shows up and I see something totally different. I'm like, okay, change of plans. You, These are living, breathing, thinking, emotional creatures. Yep. You know, there is no one size fits all. There, there just isn't, you know, and, and you have to to be able to adapt 
to that, you know, that, that specific dog, you, you just have to, it's like, and with the boarding trains, I know so many trainers struggle with the go home lessons and it can be extremely stressful because there's so much information to pass along. You know what I mean? What we're yep. doing, yep. we're not training the dog. We're just teaching the dog how to learn and, and setting a foundation for what's to come once we get with the owners. You, you, you know what I mean? And a lot of times what I've found, not only the simpler that I keep it for the people on that handoff, the better they do. But a lot of times now, Russ, if they didn't come from far away, unfortunately, I get people coming from far away and I don't like it because what I prefer to do when I hand the dog over to someone within within an hour or two from me, I don't like to do anything at times. Depending on the people's demeanor, did they just get drive back from Florida, get back from vacation? You know, is the dog so excited to go home or just exhausted and ready for a break? All these little things. But many times I'll just say, just take the dog, do nothing. Just let the dog settle back in. I'll see you in a week. OK, that's what we'll do. And that has been a tremendous benefit. This past weekend, um, my wife went with me and I took um, Rita back, the German short hair pointer. You know, great, great family, young couple, just awesome people. I did way more than I should have with her because I just wanted them to be, because Rita's kind of crazy. You know, she's a really high energy dog and um, I should have done less, but I was there. I, we took the dog to them, but that dog was so keyed in on me. Like everything I had the, tried to have the owners too. She was really just wanting to work with me. You yeah. know, and the funny thing is at one point, I sent the owner to the far end of the yard. He put Rita in a down at one end and I had him call her out of a down and she started taking off and like halfway there, she stopped and looked at me to make sure it was okay. You know what right. I mean? And so right. I said, you know what? Let's just end it. She's tired. She's done. Enjoy her. Don't worry about training right now. I'll come back within this week and we'll set everything straight. You have, you have to be able to change things up like that. So when you, know? you when you send a dog home, I like what you're saying about sometimes doing nothing because I had an interesting yeah. situation similar to that recently with the whole COVID thing where mm -hmm. I couldn't really do a go home session because yeah. it was like right when New York shut down and there was no personal meetings or anything, but I had this dog with me and I couldn't keep this person's dog. Um, so I basically the, the go home was I, I dropped dogs off by the owner's homes usually for go home and we do it in the person's home. So I, I like it in that real life setting where the dog really lives. Yeah, um, yeah. So I just drove to their house, got out of their car, handed them their dog's leash and said goodbye. And it was the weirdest thing ever. And we, we spoke via FaceTime yeah. and we gave them a lot of direction and guidance and the dog is doing awesome. Like it's yeah. living a great life now. And, but it was an interesting thing that you brought that up because I, I was forced into doing that recently and it ended up turning out really well. But yeah. when you do that, do you give any sort of direction of like, what life should look like and not training in per se, because I think that I think we both agree that there's two parts to training in a sense. There's like mm -hmm. how you live with your dog and then the active yeah. things that you do with your dog for training. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, the living stuff is the stuff I push and, yeah. and, and that's the stuff I don't budge on, you know? And what I tell them is do me a favor. And especially in the beginning, I say, give me five minutes twice a day of the obedience. And they look at me like, that's it. I'm like, yeah, if you can give me 10 minutes, twice a day, three times a day. Great. But at least five minutes twice a day, because everyone's going to do that. And I keep that end of it extremely simple. I want the people to understand how to handle the leash, how to give the command, how to use the marker, the timing of a reward. If we're using rewards, I want them to understand leash pressure, really simple things, because they're going to make progress if they do that. But I tell them, but I need 24 hours a day inside the home. Right. No more bad habits. That's stuff we have to change because that's where the everlasting results come from. Not from come down, sit in place. You know, you know what I mean? That stuff's great, but that's that's whipped cream. That's just, you know, dessert as far as I'm good. It's icing on the cake. You have to focus on that stuff inside the home. You, you, you just you just have to. You know what I mean? Because these dogs will go right back. It doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter who does the training. They'll go right back to what they were doing before if they're not held accountable and things don't change, you know what I mean? I'll just yeah. give you an example again with Rita, where we saw a tremendous change. She just would not tune into our owners. Nose was in the ground. It's like she was just so scatterbrained being back at her house. Right. And we're standing there talking at one point 
and Rita was standing, sitting in front of her owner. He stand, we're standing outside, you know, she's looking away from him. So I said, take that leash. And I had him pull her back next to him. Like we were starting to heal for a walk. And just that little change right there completely changed the dog. Okay. Because now if she goes to move, I tell him, just give her a little pop with the leash and put her back to where she was. That's all it took. And just right. that little change now allows the dog to realize, okay, now I have to pay attention to him just like I did the good looking guy over there, meaning me, you know, yeah. but it's these little things that people are ignoring and not paying attention to that. That leash is still our best tool. You know, that's our translator tells the dog what you want. And it's our GPS tells the dog where you want it. And it's, it's just so overlooked, you, you know, and, I think when people think of me, they think e-collar, e-collar, e-collar. And of course I do the e-collar work, but if they saw how much more work I did without the e-collar, how much work I do on leash with just a leash and a flat collar, like repetitions to nauseam when it comes to all the basics. But then I do a lot of just being with the dog silent and allowing the leash to do the talking. If the dog's going to get up and go sniff and I haven't released it yet, bring the dog back, giving the dog information that's going to help it inside the home when it gets back home. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's just, there's too many people ignoring that stuff, in my opinion. When you send the dog home, let's say, for like, if you are, if you're deciding like they live close enough and you're sending it home mm -hmm. without an official go home, right? And then you're yeah. gonna meet up with them again. Do you go over all of this stuff still with them so that they actually know how to live with the dog properly? I, I go over the important stuff yeah. that I want them, um, especially if the dog has specific behaviors, things I don't want, you know, um, the things that are really going to create the bad habits. Right. You know what I mean? Just, I, I had someone wanting to do a phone consult. Dog has a lot of human bites, tons of human bites. Okay. I don't try to fix that stuff over the, that's not my thing, but I want to know more. So I didn't charge the people or nothing. We're just talking. I'm getting the information. I had them send me videos, send me a bunch of videos working to do, because I'll be able to see more. And so if you're telling me that you have a dog that's biting everyone, including people in the family, and then I see videos and I see all of your dogs in your bed. And when I say, is that your bed? You know, the second I hear any reason why or excuses, I won't follow up with them. I can't right. because I don't want to waste anyone's time and take their money, you know? And if you have a dog that's biting anyone, when you have a serious issue like that, the only way that could truly be fixed is by an owner that says, tell me what to do and I'll do it. You know, that that's what's required with a dog like that. It has to be 100 percent commitment. And if there's important things like that, that might not be important to the next trainer. To me, it is. Yeah. You know, you can't allow these things to go on and think that I can help you with your dog. I don't want your money. I'm not going to take it. You know what I mean? I'm just not the right trainer for you. Someone else will. Someone will take your money, but I can guarantee it's not going to be fixed. And and because I'll, I'll I'll fix it for free. Stop all this stuff that you're doing, and you're going to see a difference. Put a leash on the dog, and don't allow the dog any freedom at all to do the things it's doing. Let's start there. But if you can't do that, you you know don't waste your money with me. You know. Yeah, restricting restricting freedom and like space is is probably one of the most powerful things that I've seen change a dog more mm -hmm. than like training. Like there's when a dog comes to me on, on the first day, the first, first 24 hours. So I do ex like exclusively board and trains. And when a dog comes to me within that first 24 hours, I see a change in the dog's behavior and it's overall state of being. And I haven't oh, yeah. done much with it besides hang out, maybe go for a walk up and down the block take it out of its crate for patty time, just exist with it around the house, basic stuff, very basic stuff just to get to know it. But already the dog starts to shift. And I think that a lot of that just comes from changing up the dog's number one normal routine, but also restricting freedom and like controlling its space. So people talk a lot about a dog's resources being important to it, but they're usually thinking of food and toys. Yes. But there's so much more. Like I think space is one of the most important resources to a dog. Yeah, and so yeah. overlooked. It's just given out for free right away. So like, you're using something that's an important currency to a dog, and just giving it to it for free right when it comes home. Like, you're gonna have issues. 
Right. Well, you you said it's it's base it's basic to us. It's not basic to them. It's everything to them. So there is no bigger freedom than reward and the ability to go sniff or pee or poop and see every dog needs somebody. So no matter how shitty the dog is when it comes in, it doesn't take long to figure out, okay, if you if you go out to where you you have your dogs and the dog's got some issues with people and at first, you know, it may be real anxious or real nervous or show a little regret, whatever. After a couple of days of not training and just allowing the dog to be, though that posture always turns to the ass wagon when you go out, you know, excitement to see you because that dog needs somebody to get those things that it has to have in its life, you know, and when you're you become- providing the meals and the freedom and the space, you know, and the ability to go to the bathroom, you become very important. And then yeah. the training is a lot easier, you know, yeah. a lot it's, easier. It's like you become important to the dog so that it actually has a reason to listen to you before you start telling it to listen to you. Yeah, no, it's, you know, I got, I got Patton back here, the black German shepherd that's always here. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because at home he's a wild man, you know, he's a 15, 16 month old, high drive working line shepherd. And the funny thing is when I brought him here the other day, the second I took his leash off, he went back to looking at me with all the rules and all the boundaries, like nothing had changed. And I was like, I was so blown away by that, you know, because he knows what the rules are here. And he's a incredible, he's as good as a dog as you could ever hope to get to train, you know, but at home, he's allowed to have a lot of freedom and, you know, I told his owner, it's it's like allowing a 16-year-old boy to run loose in Las Vegas. It doesn't work. <laughs> yep. You got to set some boundaries, you know. You but give it all gonna, the good stuff. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of hookers running around. You can't do that. <laughs> you know? right, one second, I have a little puppy that just is running around behind me and I want to put her away. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. I think I, left right. crate, I think I left her crate door open and she was just spinning in circles behind me when she shouldn't be I running around. Something. I figured there was yeah. something there. I was like hoping she's just going to lay down and chill, but she's yeah. not doing that. So I just put her back away. That's great. Um, so I know that you don't use prong collars anymore. I'm shifting subjects for a quick second. Yeah. So you don't use prong collars anymore, but I also know that you used to use them, right? No, opposite. I never used to. Oh, use you them. never used them. No, okay. and I never you- used them. Was never against them. Don't have a problem with them. Um, the only thing that I used to try to tell people was the average dog owner, because of their trainer, is relying too much on the tools. Okay, and what I try to tell people is, if you have a dog that pulls like a bull. And you put a prong collar on it and it helps. Of course, people are going to want to do that. I understand. But is the dog trained? If the prong collar comes off, what does the dog do? It goes right back to what it was doing before. So what I like to do is, I'll use Rita again, last dog here. Her owners use a prong collar. I took it off when she got here. They Actually, they didn't come here with it because they know that I don't use them. And... I had to teach her to walk nicely on just a flat collar. Okay. I'm a dog trainer. That's what I'm supposed to be able to do. But the reason being Russ is once you get that from him with just a leash and a flat collar, now the dog truly knows how to do it. And now when you put that prong collar on the dog, it's that much more effective. You understand what I'm saying? It gets to do the job that it's supposed to do with very little conflict, you know, just effortless. And it, it that that's just the way I like to do things. Right. I've I've used them more recently because I, I was just saying this in the last live. I think someone that I respect a lot in the industry, someone that I look up to, was you know said to me basically in a nutshell. He's like, you know, you, you said you've changed a lot of minds around the world when it comes to the e collar. And I was like, well, I appreciate that. I don't, I don't know how much I had to do with it, but thank you. And, yeah. and, and then he said. Uh, he said, well, just imagine if you did that with the prong collar. And I felt like this big. I was like, <laughs> all right. So I do try to use them a little more. Um, but usually the people won't even know that I'm using them, you know, because I'm, I'm going to do the training part without it. 
Right. No. That's why I assume that you never use them because I don't think I've ever seen one with, on a dog. Yeah. That you use. And I've heard you speak about this idea that you're not against it, but you didn't really use them much. So you use right. it really more as a way of reinforcing what the dog learned without it. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. I, I picture it like the e-collar. The e-collar is not being used until the dog knows everything it needs to know. Same right. thing with the prong collar. I got a lot of hate from the prong collar statement I made a couple of years ago. I mean, a lot of hate. I, I couldn't believe it. And I'm thinking that I say something that I, I had to watch the video again. And in there, all I said was I don't use them. I said, but it's a great tool. I'm not against, I literally said it's right. a great tool, I'm not against, but because I didn't use them, people said trainers and they were old crotchety people, all of them, you know, said now their clients want to know if I don't use them, why are they using them? So that's not my problem. If your clients have more faith in me than they do, that's your problem. Yeah. And I got some nasty shit over that. I, I really did. I couldn't believe it, you know, and I used to say something once a week to piss somebody off. And then it got to maybe once a month, and now I'm I'm pretty good. I, I don't, I, you know, I don't do it on purpose, but I am pretty opinionated. And sometimes I have a hard time keeping my mouth shut. My wife and my daughter really monitor. They keep you in check. <laughs> oh, they, listen, I got a nasty email the other day. This blew me away, Russ. I'm not even kidding. I had to show my wife this and I don't show her stuff. I thought it was a joke at first. It was from a woman. And I'm not doing this to bash her because, I, you know, I kind of let it go and say I told her it's no problem. Don't worry about it. But basically what she did was rip me apart and say she loves my training. I've helped her a lot, loves all the free content. But, you know, she doesn't want to hear about my gorgeous wife and my happy life and my perfect kids because she doesn't have a good life. And it makes her feel bad. And I really hit the roof. I was and the only thing I said you know, I'll block you. So my happiness doesn't offend you, yeah. you know, and it really did bother me. But when I sent that, my wife jumped down my throat and Sophia was furious at me. Like she's really mad because the way Sophia saw it was this person is sad and is struggling and you're just ripping her apart. I said, I'm not, do you see that it didn't, it didn't matter to my family. They said either respond respectfully or don't respond at all you know at the end of the day it's it's like that same thing that you, you were kind of saying earlier about other trainers who bash it's like I, obviously it sucks on your end for someone to say that to you right because that's like just a it's a stupid thing to say like really stupid but like imagine how sad and lonely her life must be to have right. that I mean, you know yeah, and, and we had more of a conversation and she explained herself more and i understood it and and i said i you know accept your apology it's it's fine and i probably shouldn't have let it but the thing listen if someone attacks my training and goes after me that doesn't bother me the thing that always gets me the most for us if i say something that's not dog related and people basically tell me shut up and stick to dogs that that infuriates right. me because it's like, I'm not supposed to have an opinion on anything. I'm only supposed to produce free content when it comes to dog training. That I don't have a lot of patience for, you, you know. I, I'll block someone in a heartbeat for that, you yeah. know, because you don't value me. You just want free stuff that I put out there. So right. see ya. And you it's, like, it's like you're a dog trainer, but you're you're not just a dog trainer. Like there's so much more this to you and people get upset about that. This is my personal page. I don't yeah. have a business page. I'm not asking people for likes and follows on my business page, or I'm not trying to make money on face. I just have a Facebook page and everything dog is on there and food and bourbon and whiskey and family, you know, that's, that's who, that's yeah. who I really am. And so it's not some kind of facade. I do have a really good life. I'm actually a very happy person and I have much more than I deserve. You know, I know a lot of people that post stuff, they're not always you see what they want you to see, but I really do have a good life. And then yeah. and that's why, like we talked about earlier, when I see these trainers that spend so much time every day going after other people, it's, it's sad because you're extremely unhappy if you follow someone you don't like. I can't imagine doing <laughs> that. You know, if I don't like you, I'm not going to I'm going to unfollow your page. I don't want to see your stuff. You know, I just and but those people. 
they'll get people to latch on for a little while. And then the people that follow them usually see how toxic they are and how there's nothing but negativity. And then they usually start to figure out most of what they're saying is bullshit and people go their own way. And then they'll send yeah. you an email and say, man, I'm so sorry. You know, I, I, I should have never, never followed what those people were saying. And it happens all, all the time. And I don't have any hatred for those people. I've talked to almost everyone that's ever come after me and done videos about me. I've, I've had conversations with almost every one of them. I try to have a civil conversation, but you could tell when someone has no interest, they have it in personally for you, even though they'll never say it's personal. They, they'll say it's not personal, but it is because usually it's someone that I've said something negative about in response to what they do. And they can, the weak people can't handle it. They just fold and they hold on to that bitterness forever. You know, it just destroys them. Let it destroy them. What, what can I, I do? It attracts toxicity. So like, the only people that are going to stay with it are the toxic people. Everyone else is going to feel it sooner or later. It's going to come through. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, you know, like I said, if you've been doing this 20, 30, 40 years and you're struggling in your family or your business life, you're going to blame people that are doing well because of social media. And, and, and to a point, it's valid in many cases, you know, but someone's success just because maybe they aren't that skilled it doesn't affect your success you know right. what i mean that's all on you you have all the power to create the success it has nothing to do with social media you know but they want they need to have something to blame to feel better about themselves and, and, and they're it boils down to personal responsibility or shifting the blame and it's like that's I think that's just real what to me what it comes down to. Like if you're looking for someone else to blame, you're never gonna solve the problem in general, no. like dog training, anything. No, definitely not. Definitely and, not. So I know there was some things that you wanted to discuss when we were chatting in Messenger earlier. You wanted to talk about e collars, I think, and overuse of them. Is that if I'm correct? Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, the the timing behind that, Russ, normally I don't care what we talk about, but Dave Croyer had put out a podcast uh, about you know, e-collars and the usage of e-collars. And, and Dave is someone I respect immensely. He, he, there's no doubt this guy's one of the best in the world. And I love the content that he puts out on his, um, he has a, a subscription thing you could do. It's like 10 bucks a month or something. Yeah, and worth every penny about it. because the dude's a world-class trainer, you know, but the information he put out in that podcast, it was just so honest and so real it was so valid and it was so nice to hear because sometimes i i feel like it's the same people that talk about it and i know i'm one of them i'm very vocal but who am i i'm nobody you know dave's been on the world stage many many times and what he said you know and what i told him was pure gold you know it was just so good because he talked about using punishment also but dave trains like you know, 99% purely positive, like myself, me yeah, too. Yeah. You know, I, I'm much closer to a purely positive trainer than I am, you know, an e-collar trainer in air quotes. I hate doing air right. quotes, but for me, the usage of the e-collar is to provide off leash freedom for my client's dogs. That's it. Now, if someone tells me they never want their dog off leash for me and the e-collar has no purpose then. You know, we're going to stick to the leash and training will be easy. That would be that would be beautiful. You know, I would love that. But the truth is, every single person that comes to me wants to do econ work. It's not mandatory. And I put that right on my website. Not mandatory. It's recommended if you want off leash freedom, because the average dog owner isn't going to train like a dog trainer. Right. You know, and people don't understand the amount of work it takes. You know, how many repetitions to teach a dog these behaviors. So when you have a dog like Rita, the German short hair pointer or Tibby, the Gordon setter was that was here. These dogs are bird crazy and highly driven. The one on Tibby's owner lost a dog already because it took off after something got hit by a car. So their requirement was very simple. We have to be able to control our dog off leash. You know what they get to do now? Not only does she not run off, but they can go to the park and let her run and be a Gordon Center. Yeah. 
And if you have a dog that's bred to run, like a hunting dog or a herding dog, and the dog never gets off leash, that's a miserable life for a dog. That's a miserable life. Dogs are meant to run. Okay. Now, people are going to say, we train dogs off leash for years without e-collars. Absolutely. But you're a dog trainer and the average person isn't. But we also use rotary phones. Why do you have a cell phone now? Why not just stick to the rotary phone? You know, what's what's the difference? Because technology is better and we have more abilities to do things now. And the e-collars today are nothing like they were 20 years ago. Nothing like not even close. So yeah. if I put in the right amount of work with these and I keep these dogs for over a month, you know, but that's just the beginning. Then the real work starts when I go with the owners. And they have to be able to understand how to have full control of their dog off leash without being harsh, you know. But the way we train, if they do have to be harsh to protect the dog, it's not an issue. The dog doesn't fold. The dog doesn't get destroyed. The people don't get destroyed because they understand. You know what I'm saying? And so over the past, I don't know, I think I put out my first e-collar video 13 years ago, maybe. And back then I started because I had seen back to the trainers. I learned a lot from, I've seen some brutal stuff done with the e-collar, you know, and I've never, I've never done it. I've never been brutal with the dog in any way. Just not my nature. I could be brutal with a person. I can't be brutal with the dog, you know? <laughs> and so my whole goal from the first horrible video that I shot, I think like Sophia is like friggin', you know, farting and burping in the background, you know, and laughing. And I mean, she's just a baby. And it was the whole purpose was to get people to stop frying their dogs. That was it. And that's kind of been my mission the whole way through. You know, you, you always you never see me trying to teach advanced things with the e-collar because it's not necessary. Right. You have to understand the most basic usage and how to teach the dog to understand what it means. You know, I'm teaching the dog a language. I'm not using it to punish the dog. Dogs that spend a month here rarely see a correction with the e-collar. Doesn't mean I won't, but if you teach it properly, you're using very little corrections in dog training. You know what I mean? Now, if I take that dog back home and the dog does something with the owners, I don't hesitate that you have the owners use punishment or me use punishment because the dog has to learn. Now you got to do that stuff here too. You know what I mean? Right. But the whole purpose is that the dog understands why. So there is no negative blowback from any tool that you're using. You know what I mean? So when people say, you know, back to crotchety people that, you know, the e-collar destroys the relationship or the dog doesn't understand you. Really? Because I've shown a lot of dogs over the years and you never see one that I don't have a beautiful relationship with. All those dogs are trained on an e-collar. You know what I mean? Doesn't mean right. they were trained with an e-collar. Everything they do, because they talk about what I do, the e-collar part is a very small part of it. And that comes into play now, especially even later into the training than I used to. I used to go to it fairly quickly. But even back then, I wasn't using it to teach anything. Everything was taught with a leash. Then later on in, in the years, I started adding food. And when we started getting to a more modern way of using the e-collar, nothing I created or invented, you know, I made it my own. I did things maybe a little differently, but once we started adding food with that and clarity with it, years ago, even if you weren't harsh when you started the e-collar stuff, even if you were gentle with it, there was still a period of confusion with the dogs, sometimes for three days. And day three, you'd see them change. But the way we use it now, you don't see that anymore. You see the dog catch on and be enthusiastic from day one with it, you know, because we make it very clear and we make it rewarding for the dog. And that's why dogs that suffer with anxiety and are fearful and weak minded dogs, that's why they do so good with it. You know, for the first time, maybe in their life, they get to better their own situation and create a better situation. You know, it all comes down to them. They have a say in it. That's very empowering to a dog. And it shows. Yep. And that's why those fearful dogs turn around so fast. So when I see these trainers, you know, bad mouthing someone putting an e-collar on a, a fearful dog, maybe that person shouldn't be because maybe it is going to be punitive. That's not what I do, but I'm not the only one that trains the way I do. There's a lot of people out there. 
And that's why when, when Dave put out that podcast, it was just so refreshing to hear someone of his caliber talk about it. And so honestly, and, you know, I, I advise everyone, if you're a dog trainer, sign up on his online program. It's worth every penny, $10 a month. You're not going to find a better deal. You know, with the, this is a guy that's been on the world team. I don't know, 13, 14 times or something. You know, he's a brilliant guy. So people like Dave and Bart and Ivan and Michael Ellis, these are trainers that pet dog trainers really need to be looking at and learning from. And there's more. There's plenty more than that, too. You know what I mean? Those are just a lot of the guys that I always send pet dog trainers to. Because if you understand the complexity of a working dog, it's going to make you a better trainer with pet dogs. I, I guarantee it. You know, so <clears throat> when you first started training, you was a, there was a big period of time. I think you said thirteen years or something like that, where you didn't use e collars at all, right? Yeah, no, it was just no. A leash and a dog. That's and it. What What made you switch? What made you decide, like, okay, this e collar is a good idea? I hated e collars because I was a hunter as a kid. Okay, so I'm going back forty years now. And whenever the first Tritronics collar came out, yeah. bird dog people were using them out in the woods. I was a big pheasant hunter. And I saw dogs just screaming and yelping and running faster to get away. I saw a lot of unruly dogs. None of the dogs were trained like we train today with the e collar. None of them. I, yeah, I just didn't see any. So I hated them for a long time. And then I started seeing a couple of people using e collars and the dogs looked very different. And I was fascinated. And I think probably around, I don't know, whenever the internet came up, 2006 or seven, maybe, or 2005, somewhere around there, early 2000s, is when you were able to start watching some videos. And so there were people using e collars on dogs that wasn't what I remembered. And so I got fascinated and I started looking into it and I started working with some people. Um, but even then, when I started, it was still too much pressure based. There was no food involved. I was getting good results, but I didn't like it. And so I tell people for one year, I became a shitty trainer because it was too much e collar based. It was all e collar. I wasn't doing the things that are really important to me the behavior and the relationship. It was all e collar, e collar, e collar. You know what I mean? Yeah, you had to sell e collars and you had to use e collars and it just it just wasn't for me and i had met a lot of great trainers through through that time too but i just i didn't like it and i went back to training the way i used to with the leash and everything and it wasn't too long after that i started seeing more people turn to food yeah. and i think i think bart was the first person i remember who was very anti food turning to food and then I started seeing the e-collar used in a different way with food. And the second I made it my own from what other people were doing, the difference in the dogs was mine. I couldn't believe it. You know, I just I couldn't believe the difference in the dogs from day one, no matter what kind of dog you did. And from there, it's changed a little bit, but not much. And it's just gotten better and better and better. And I don't think a lot of people understand the power of negative reinforcement, whether it be a leash or an e-collar paired with positive reinforcement. It's simple. It's been around forever, yeah. but there's still people that don't utilize it. And it's very, very powerful in the dog world. It, it really is. You know, they have just read, get it. Sorry. Have you read um, Colonel Moss's book an old dog training book um, from Germany? Colonel Moss. No. Okay. He's, I don't Conrad? know. Oh, wait, Conrad? Yeah, Conrad. Conrad. Oh, yeah. Yeah, one of my favorite books. So of, I read that a, a long time ago when I first started getting very interested in dog I behavior. Training training. Manual by Con yeah. Conrad. Yeah. Yep. So in there, like, I haven't looked at that in, in must be like four years that I la last read anything from it. But he speaks about recall, right? And he speaks yeah. about old school recall using like a switch and yeah. another handler. And, a, and a, a food at the other end, and that's negative reinforcement. Well, it's more it's more punishment, I guess you would say, uh -huh. but it's kind of like e-collars when used properly is a gentler, more modern way of doing that, right? Yeah. Where the dog right. feels that sensation, knows how to shut it off by coming to you and then getting the food. Yeah. And well, it's almost, 
it's a great book and it's actually the last book I was reading. Yeah. Yeah. I, but you know what, Russ? Um, if the dog is next to me within my reach, mm -hmm. if I have to apply a correction, I would choose the leash every time over the e-collar. Every time. I want it coming from me. Yeah. Like, to me, that's very important. But to be able to not just correct the dog or implement punishment at a distance, but direction, a tactile signal, direction, communication, when you can do all that stuff with the dog when it's away from you, that's extremely powerful in the dog's mind. Extremely powerful. You know what I mean? And so when you take, you know, most of the people I work with are average dog owners. When mm -hmm. you can allow an average dog owner to go to a park or go on a hike and have their dog 100 yards away and just tap an e-collar at a low level, not punitive, and have the dog just come flying back to them happy. Do you know what that does to the average dog owner? They're, that's all they care. It, it's mind changing. To, it's mind blowing to them. Because it opens up their life with that dog. And now they can take the dog places and do things with it. And the dogs live a better life. Yeah. And so these purely positive people, I've never had issues with a lot of purely positive. I actually get a lot of good feedback. Very few have come after me because they can't. I don't give them reason to. They see how I interact with the dogs. You know, I've had some very good feedback. And I've had a lot of people make the switch. But what the people that won't make the switch understand is, most good balanced trainers are heavily leaning into purely positive. That's what most of us teach things with. But if you're just stopping there, it's incomplete training and it's unfair to the dog. It yeah. just is. And you're setting the dog up for failure. And when you set a dog up for failure, they could really lose big time in the end. And there has to be consequences for doing good and there has to be consequences for doing bad. And good, proper e-collar training, along with a person understanding the behavior that is set up inside the home, can keep more dogs out of the shelters than anything else. Purely positive training will never keep the shelters empty. It keeps them full. That's a fact. Okay? And that's not me trying to be little, purely positive training. Yeah. I have no issue if someone wants to train that way. I'm a, a total, I, I've conversed with many of them. But a lot of the people I know also know they're not going to take on certain dogs. You know, you want a dog trained to do something and have fun and tricks. Yeah, 100 percent. Go ahead. You don't need anything else. But there's more to it, you know, and you have to be able to utilize all the things available to allow the dog to truly learn. That doesn't mean you have to be harsh or barbaric. It just means you have to be clear and be able to deliver the information that helps the dog. Because in the end, this is about helping the dog. And just sticking to being a purely positive trainer is helping your emotions. It's not helping the dog, you know? Yeah, a client said it to me best yesterday, actually, which is always awesome when the clients, like, get that aha moment where it just clicks. Yeah. And he said to me, he's like, now we have a full toolbox. Because until now, we always knew how to reward our dog. We always yeah. knew how to just... Everyone, the average dog owner can take some food and teach their dog to sit or lay down, right? Yeah, it's not right. that crazy. But now he's like, we have a full toolbox to communicate, like the full spectrum, everything the dog needs to know, and everything that that we need to know in order to help the dog stay in a mindset of actually wanting to listen to us, right? right. And he he was a um, a safety manager for a construction site, so he's like, I think of everything as tools. So. Yeah, yeah. So to me, it's like you handed me a full toolbox now, and we have a lot more to work with, and it just That's makes it a lot it. easier on our end and on the do dog's end so we could actually communicate with each other. It becomes a conversation yeah. as opposed to just a command, right? As opposed to just a trick. It's a back-and-forth conversation using these tools. Yeah, yeah, it's that's awesome. And, and when you get that kind of feedback from people, it does make you feel good because you know that you're giving people power. You're giving yeah. them powerful education. Which in, in, in the long run, that's what the dog needs. It needs people to understand what the dog needs, you know. And like the person I talked about earlier, I'm not doing it to, to badmouth them or nothing. But if you're using your dog to fulfill your emotional needs or voids, it's always going to ruin the dog. It's just not natural in their world.
you know, yeah. and, and you know, dogs in the suburbs don't live a natural world. If you're in the big city, at least they have to get out every day and migrate to go pee and poop, you know, and there's people all over. That's more of a natural world to a dog than being in the suburbs. If you go out in the country and the dogs are left outside and they're out on the farm and they get to be dogs, same thing. They get to live more of a life that's that's what they're meant to be. But yeah. we take dogs into the suburbs, you know, you get a fenced backyard like I have, you know, and the dog's in, in the home or stays in the yard or whatever. It's, they just struggle. They suffer. You know, people say I have a big backyard. It doesn't care. Your dog knows every single smell and leaf and stick and part of your backyard. It's not interesting anymore. There is no mental stimulation there. And the physical stimulation is just, you know, I heard someone say it before. I forget who. It's like a fish being, it's just a big fishbowl for a dog. You're just going around. It's it's, it's not good. You know, it's, it's, it's just, it's just not. So we got to give these dogs something. But if you can't take your dog out without it acting like like a lunatic, that's a problem. You know, yeah, it's almost understandable why dogs would have behavioral issues when we put them in that environment. Like yeah. if you take someone who's lives in one place and used to a specific culture and language and everything and drop there someone else somewhere else where they, they don't know how to talk the language. They don't know anything. There's going to be so much confusion that with a dog, the only way it's going to come out is in behavior. That's the only way to express that confusion. They can't go and talk to someone about it. It's going to yeah. come out in a way of like that. We're calling them like lunatics and crazy and all that. And the dog is just totally confused in this strange world we put them in. It's, yeah. like, it's the, I think it's like only right as a human taking this animal that doesn't exist in this state naturally, that when we do that, that we, we should be responsible for giving them everything they need, including all that guidance, not just food, water, and a backyard, because it's so much more than that. It's a big responsibility, you know, a, a big responsibility, you know, and, you know, then you run into people that do want to do the best thing. Did you see the video of the little Frenchie I posted what a phone consultation client was doing? Yes. Yeah. I saw it on your Instagram. Did you see that dog? Yeah, that was awesome. That's that's the first client I ever had, Russ, where I said, stop training. No more. <laughs> training. I said, take the e-collar off. No more e-collar and stop training. Just be with the dog. And he's like, that's going to be hard for me. I said, give me a week. And no lie, he texted me right at the week mark. Okay, it's been this many hours. I'm like, just relax. Just eat. enjoy the dog. Yeah. And he saw that dog really flourish when he started. He's a great guy. And he wants to do the right thing. But he just kept seeing it as training, training, training. And that dog's only a year old. Oh, wow. So once he removed the tools and just allowed the dog to be, then you see that dog flying around. In there. And that's the other thing, too. Dogs won't, you know, perform without the e-collar on. My people's dogs do very well. And that guy was perfect example. And uh, he had a lot of views on those videos because he's done a tremendous job. That's an owner that said, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Okay, you're doing actually too much. Let's slow down. Let's enjoy the dog. It's still a baby. You know, it's a young yeah. dog. And once he did that, then especially once he went back to doing some work, dogs need breaks. You know, I give them breaks here all the time. You know, give them my own dogs. If I'm teaching something complicated, I'll take several weeks off from teaching that behavior. And every time I go back to it, they're much further along the way than they were when we stopped, you know, they just, I think, they I think, and it sounds like you'd probably agree with, I'm going to, with what I'm going to say that a lot of, I think that the average dog isn't necessarily really wired to be in work mode all the time. Right. And they naturally do a lot of nothing, right. Or a lot of just hanging out, a lot of existing. Yeah. I'll tell you when I really saw this. So I went to Ukraine and there they have like a lot of street dogs and a lot yeah. of, dogs that live in like the forest and they're not they don't relate to humans in the same way as our pets do they just yeah. exist around humans it's almost like squirrels right, right? They're there and i left my 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 group for a little bit and i went to go watch these dogs and i was just sitting like on the side of the road in a little foresty area and i was watching from afar and these dogs i was must have been there for four hours just watching them because i was fascinated to see how dogs actually act when they're alone and yeah. most of the time they did nothing. They laid there in a group, like laying almost on top of each other, like very close 
to each other and just laid there doing nothing. And then at nighttime, they went out, they got their food, they went back to their, their area and did a lot of nothingness. And those were dogs that were just being allowed to exist, right? There was no human telling them what to do or anything. And they weren't looking for something to do much. They were yeah. able to just exist because they were being allowed to exist. And what I kind of saw from that is I think that we, in a sense, make dogs look for something to do a lot of times. Right. When really they could be okay with doing nothing if we give them that option. Just a lot of times we, as humans, we're like, well, we love to keep busy. Probably our dog always wants to keep busy too when yeah. many dogs just want the chance to just chill, just like re let it just relax and do nothing. And that's why my dogs, even the higher driven dogs, um, that's part of the reason why they're crazy about Sophia, because she will spend time just sitting out in the back porch with them, enjoying each other. She did it from yeah. the time the dogs were young, you know, when she was she was real young. When I got Luca, she was what five years old, I guess, when I got Luca, six years old, something like that. And she did it back then, you know, and so. When I would go away, she was a very young girl when she was able to take all my dogs out, Rottweiler and, and Belgian Malinois, off leash, never had any problems. They did what she said. Same thing with my son, you know. They understand how to respect the dogs, but they spend time just being. And you could see how the dogs are with them because of it. Luca, Luca and my wife have a completely different relationship. Like, the only time he's really just mellow and just relaxed is in her presence. He goes to her when we go to bed, he literally has to wait till she gets in bed and he'll go over and say good night to her. And then at night, if my wife coughs or rolls over or gets antsy, he gets up and he goes over and he checks on her. And that's their relationship with me. He's crazy about me. He won't take his eyes off me, but it's always about the work. We're going to do something. Right. Because that I, was what you built with him. Right. And I think it's probably even a nice relief for him just to be with people that he could just relax with. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's why I got Mango. I wanted a dog that can they could spend more time with than me and just be the ultimate family dog. I wanted I wanted to make Mango a combination of Bruno, my Rottweiler and Luca. And that's exactly what we got. She's a really, really great dog. And I could have her in any situation. and She does really well. But the big biggest reason that is because of the time my family puts in with those dogs, you know? Yeah. It helps, helps big time. You yeah, know? the existing is everything. Another thing that I learned from you that also is powerful is, so you were saying once in a video, I think it was a dog that came off of a plane. Yeah. Uh, maybe great it was a Dane. Great Dane. Dane. yeah. yeah. And you were saying that basically all you were doing was moving the dog back to you every time it pulled yeah. away. You were just, you were being nonverbal about it. And you're like, this is the boring stuff that no one wants to see. And yeah. that's that existence though, is where you're just teaching the dog just to hang with you. And that like, there's no point in pulling away, just stay with you, just stay with you, but in a nonverbal way. And eventually the dog just chills out with you because you're just doing nothing. The dog just starts to do nothing. And then you get to build that existence with each other. Yeah, well, you, you know, I put out a couple of videos, Russ, of teaching a dog how not to pull using that leg swing and everything. And the funny thing is, I'll get comments, well, do that with an untrained dog. And I think that's the ultimate compliment because th that's what I'm showing, you know. <laughs> so with that dog in particular, I started filming at the airport. She came mm -hmm. in on a private jet. It was, the, it was the funniest thing to see. But she had a harness on and that dog was pulling us across the parking lot, you know. So we got her to my house and we literally started filming immediately. And I think it's called um, how training starts, something like mm -hmm. that. So I always say training starts before the training starts. And that's what I mean. So I didn't just bring her into my house and put her in a pen or something and wait. No, I stood there. And just like I do with every dog that shows up here for a private lesson and her natural instinct is to pull away. And I just bring her back. I don't say anything. I don't ask for anything. She pulls away. I bring her back. If she does that a hundred times, I'm going to bring her back a hundred times. I'm not going to correct her. I'm not going to say anything because that's what the dog's used to doing. And then what they learn very quickly is they are no longer in control of that. So it starts right from the beginning. They have to yield to you. And you get one of two things with every single dog when you do that. 
they'll either sit down and look up at you, which now I know I'm ready to move forward, or they'll lay, or they'll lay down. Okay. So I did. I taught that dog how to walk nicely with the harness on, right there on the spot. You know, and it's still not good enough because you'll still get people do that with the untrained dog. Like, do you understand this dog? Literally, watch the beginning of the video. Yeah. You know, but. It's very, very effective. And that's the behavior stuff I talk about that's silent. You know, there's no words used. There is no commands. I don't care. I'm not going to ask the dog to sit. All that stuff. I think we use way too many words. You know, I asked people a while back. I asked my clients. I said, do me a favor. Just for today, 24 hours, don't say nothing to your dog. Not a single word. And they're like, what? I'm like, nothing. Don't say nothing. I can't tell you the amount of responses I had from all kinds of people. Like that was mind blowing. Like, I can't believe how my dog changed. Yeah. Because humans, we don't shut up, you know, <laughs> and we're, we're p- repeating the same shit to these dogs over and over and over. That has no meaning to them because we overuse it so much. You know, half the dogs out there think their name is no, <laughs> you know, what <laughs> I mean? it, it's just, just quiet down and stop moving so much and, and just be with the dog. And, and I think sometimes, I think I had the connection with my Rottweiler because of all the time we spent traveling together, you know, and we traveled all over the country training dogs and doing things. And we spent a lot of time doing nothing. And, uh, you know, I think that's part of the reason it just destroyed me when I, when I lost them, you know, I mean, it just gutted me. It it really did. I, I don't handle death. Well, anyway, someone close to me or a dog, I don't handle it. Well, I really don't. Um, with him, it's something I still struggle with, you know, several years later, I, I, you know, I was doing a, a seminar in Australia and someone asked me a question and I went to answer and I had to leave the room, you know, it, it, he's just that dog that, and unless you've ever owned a Rottweiler, it's just, to me, it's a little different. Like they're, they just, they're so into you and your family and they're so expressive and, and I can't explain it, but me and him spent a lot of time on the highway, in the car, eating lunch together, you know, sleeping in hotels. And, you know, that's a, we go to Florida. Yeah, we go to Florida. Go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, like, it's more of a a companion than a pet. Absolutely. That's what changes, like, that relationship is so much deeper because of that. Obviously, everyone loves their dogs, but when it's just a pet, it's different than when it becomes your lifetime companion. Like yeah. it's a whole different thing. You spend the whole life with this dog and you don't need to say anything for you to know that he knows it. No, nah, that was my buddy. And, you know, all the shitty dogs I was training back there, he was right there with me. He was a huge part of that. And that dog taught me a lot, man. I mean, he was just amazing to watch, you yeah. know, and he, he's met people. He never, no one ever met him without falling in love with him. People were just, he was one of those Rottweilers. No one, very few people were ever scared of him because you could just look at him and tell the guy, he just had a great demeanor on him. You know what I mean? He didn't have that. The only time I've seen him like look scary, like two or three times. And that's when he had to look scary and it was extremely impressive, but he was just, he was our fan. He was born a couple of months before my daughter. So they grew up together. They were babies together, man. It's just, yeah. It's, it's the best, you know, but we got the greatest job in the world and the dog is by far the greatest creature ever created and how yes. someone could take advantage of that. I just, I just don't understand it. You know, I don't get it. So I have a question that I like to ask every trainer that I talk to. Sure. So if there was one thing that you wish every dog owner would know, what would that be? One thing. Start with one. <laughs> that That's hard. Um, I think if it was just one thing, if I had to just say one thing that your dog doesn't understand people psychology and we're being unfair by expecting them to, and they're not here long and we take them for granted because the end comes very fast. And then you always say, I wish I would have appreciated that dog more, you know? And I've gotten better at that in my older years to where I do try to enjoy the dogs more. I really do. Just being with them because with the training, Russ, sometimes you get caught up and it's always training, always focused on that. And I spend a lot of time with other people's dogs. And Mango was that dog to where I said, I'm going to get back to how I used to be. And 
I used to be much happier with my dogs. They were just our family. I didn't worry about teaching them things. Just be really well behaved wherever we go. And so we go to Florida next week and Mango's coming with us because, you know, my kids want her and she's just that kind of dog where we want her to be part of the family and she's young and that's how she's going to live the rest of her life. Like Bruno used to, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think that's awesome. Like we, we naturally assume that they get it, that they get us because we like, it's almost ingrained in us that these are just a part of family life. It's been a part of like human, the human world for so long that we've almost forgotten. Like no one's going to, assume that a cow understands human nature right because right. like we're separate from that it's not even if you own cows it's very clearly different but because dogs are literally our family right we don't get them just to live in the field the average pet dog their family and people tend to right away take it take it for granted that this animal like obviously they get us like these are always been our family it's just part of what it is like just like our kids understand us and our siblings understand us for sure our right. dog understands us and if we really want to get the most out of the relationship, I think it's like really respect the dog for who it is. And that's not a human and he doesn't understand human life. Absolutely. Listen, I'm in Kentucky. So I work with a lot of horse people Yeah, and it blows me away that I'll, I could watch a 110 pound woman take a thousand pound horse and just go. There's no asking. There's no questions. There's no begging. There's no baby voice. There's no treats. But when it comes to their 40 pound dog, they totally change, you know, yeah. and I love working with horse people because they get it. And I always ask them, why different? What's the difference? And they look at you like puzzled. Like, I, I don't know. I'm like, treat the dog like you treat the horse and you'll be blown away at the difference you see. Just go. Don't work. Don't look for the dog. Don't ask. Just go. Take the dog and go. If you yep. can pull that thousand pound horse with you, I promise the dog's going to follow. You know, I have a really good friend. And if you're watching this, you, I love you. So I could say it already. And <laughs> he owns a horse stable and he gets on horses. Like literally what you're saying. I yeah. can't, I'm a city boy. Like I get on a horse. I'm like, okay, let me figure this out. Right. Like I love the animal, but like it's, it's not right. natural to me. And he, he owns a stable and he rides these horses all the time. His three-year-old girl is on horses. Like he gives lessons. This is just his life. But his little, what is it? A uh, Aussie poo or cockapoo, like a little... 35 yeah. 40 pound dog he can't walk it on a leash like it, it doesn't work and he doesn't yeah. and i, I try to explain to him i was like you use reins like you that's a leash you steer it and it's just it's completely different it's so yeah. true how people change from that massive animal that's just normal to them and it makes sense but there's something about the dog that i guess just melts people <laughs> right yeah. they're kind of like emotional pin cushions for people yeah Oh, and, 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 you know, I deal with a lot of very powerful people, high profile people that are surrounded by yes people all the time. You know, everything is yes because of who they are. And the second they get to be home with their dogs, the dog runs the show. And I think it's just comforting for them to be in that position. And they don't want to have to tell their dog what to do because right. they're telling people what to do all the time. They get to let you down know? their guard. Like just be yeah. I see it all the time. You know, I see it all all the time. Their intentions are good. They just don't understand how damaging it is to the dog. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it, it is. Well, nobody's ever going to be short on training dogs. There's plenty of business yep. out there for, for everyone. You know, that's for sure. All right, Larry, we're going to wrap it up. It's been a little over an hour. I really, really appreciate you coming on. I'm extremely honored. Um, it was a lot of fun. A lot um, of honor is mine, buddy. I'm I'm. I'm proud of you for what you're doing. Don't, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. You're, you're a good guy. You have great intentions and, and, and you're trying to do the best you can. And, and that's why you're booked until October, you know? So don't let any of the haters affect you, ignore it and just keep learning, learn as much as you can. And, and, and you're going to do great, buddy. That's why I always come on to support you. If someone's doing these, I'm going to try to support them best I can, you know? Got to bring people together. Yeah. Unless someone is harming dogs, hey, put them on blast. Totally for that. But us older people should be helping younger trainers, not criticizing them for being successful or being wrong. Help them. Yep. You know what I mean? So I'm always here for anyone. If I could help someone, I don't have all the answers, but I got a few of them, you know? A few, a small few. <laughs> yeah. 
All right. Thank you so much, Larry. I really appreciate it. Thank you all for watching. Love you all. Have an awesome night and stay kind. You got it. Peace.